Good morning. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to John chapter 6. We're going to continue in our study of the Bread of Life discourse. In the structure of the Gospel of John, we have been through the prologue, uh, where it gave us the theological foundations of that Jesus is God, uh, come in the flesh. Uh, and then we've been in the book of signs, which is the end of chapter 1, going all the way to 12. Uh, we covered the introduction, which was just John's testimony and the early disciples. Then the second section was the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. This is where the signs actually began. Uh, the first sign was the water and the wine. Then we had the temple cleansing, the Cadimus, John's second testimony, and the Samaritan encounters. Uh, that was followed by the second sign, which was the uh, Capernaum official's son was healed by Jesus when Jesus was in Cana, which was at a great distance. In the third section, this is the section where we've been in, is the confession of the Son of God, chapter 5 through 8. Uh, we saw the uh, healing at the pool, which then led to the oneness with the Father discourse. Uh, and then after that started the feeding of the 5,000, which happened sometime later, probably almost a year later. Then Jesus walked on water, and then we had the Bread of Life discourse. So similar to chapter 5, uh, where the miracle of the healing, uh, uh, the lame man by the pool of Bethsaida, Bethsaida, it created a conflict out of which arose that dialogue, that discourse of the one with the Father uh, discourse. The feeding of, of the 5,000 follows that same pattern, where it brings up a controversy, a problem, an issue in which creates the context for which Jesus is speaking, uh, the, bread, the, the Bread of Life discourse. And now, John's presentation of the feeding of the 5,000 is one of the only miracle stories that are in all four Gospels. Uh, he focuses on the Exodus motif, that Jesus is the second Moses. Uh, we saw that in that they're all here, the large crowd is here in the wilderness. Jesus miraculously provides bread for them to eat. Uh, then Jesus goes up into a mountain to communicate with God. He's alone. Uh, then Jesus has a miracle of crossing the sea. And now we find Jesus proclaiming the words of God, just like Moses proclaimed the words of God. So this week we'll continue the Bread of Life Discourse, Part 2. John chapter 6, verses 30 through 40. We're only going to get to the next 10 verses, or 11 verses. But they are packed with theology and in great application, practical application. So this morning we're going to talk about the next two, or first two topics uh, in the Bread of Life discourse. But in order to properly understand the passage that we're going to cover today, we, we need to visit the context uh, of, of where we've been last week. So first, the location, or the geographical context, um, in chapter 6, verse 24, it said, They came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. The next verse is that they found him. Uh, so they're there in Capernaum. Uh, this is a, an artist's reconstruction of what the uh, ports look like, and there's the synagogue. Uh, and then we know from later on in chapter 6, verse 59, that this whole Bread of Life discourse happened in the synagogue. Now, if you look in the bottom picture, this is a modern picture of, of, of Capernaum. You see, this structure here is the remains of, it's a, a later church, but the foundations are of the, the actual synagogue that was in Capernaum. And this building here is over top of Peter's house. But looking back at the synagogue, an artist's reconstruction based on the archaeology there has a synagogue looks like that. It was made of darker stone, and it was done sort of in a, in a, in a kind of a Roman-esque kind of look. Uh, this is another picture of, an older picture of the re remains. You see the remains here of where the synagogue was, and this structure here is where Peter's house was. Uh, looking from a different angle, here's the synagogue here, and this is Peter's abode, Peter and Andrew. Uh, so when the group that came from that crowd that ate from the feeding of the 5,000 into Capernaum looking for Jesus, this is where they would have looked first in Peter and Andrew's uh, abode. Uh, but they didn't find him there uh, because Jesus is in the synagogue. Now, if it was the Sabbath, they wouldn't, look, they wouldn't have looked there first. They would have looked in the synagogue first. But either way, uh, they found him in the synagogue, uh, which in the interior of that synagogue, it would have looked something like this. 
it was quite a large structure. They could fit a lot of people in there. And we know that the place would have been packed. Uh, this table here is where uh, they would have uh, spoken, uh, something like this, where they would look at the Torah scrolls or some of the other uh, Old Testament or Hebrew Bible scrolls and speak. This is looking from the, uh, the other direction. Now, in the synagogue, the, the crowd found Jesus and said, said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food which, persist, uh, which perishes, but for food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father, God, has set a seal. Therefore, he said to them, uh, they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and, and said to him, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And now we come to the reading of the passage for this morning. Starting in verse 30, it says, So they said to him, What then do you do for a sign, so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread out of, out of heaven. Eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it was or is my Father who gives you true bread out of heaven. For the bread of the Father is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus said to him, to them, I am the bread of life. Who comes? Uh, who, he who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I say to you that. You have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me. That of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of the Father that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. That's the Word of God. So now let's go and look at the first topic that we're going to discuss today, which is seeing and believing. The sign of the bread of, of from heaven. Verse 30 through 36. Going to verse 30, it says, So they, they said to Him, What then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe leave you? What work do you perform? Now it's kind of curious that they are saying this. They are asking this question. Didn't they just experience a miraculous feeding of loaves and fish? Yes. They did. But more than likely the people who are asking this question are not the percentage, a small percentage of the crowd that came to Capernaum, but the people that are already in Capernaum, <coughs> already in the synagogue, who had not witnessed it. But they heard it from everyone that came in. They would come into the synagogue and, and news would have spread quickly of what Jesus had just done. Right, so, they are basically saying, what then do you do for a sign for us? So that we also may see and believe in you. The rest of these people surely believe you're the Messiah, uh, the King, and they want to take you by force to be King. So, what do you do? What work do you perform? Now, when he says what work, what deed, what behavior do you perform, God gave Moses specific signs showing that he was from God in Exodus 4. His staff, when he dropped it, became a snake. He picked it back up. It became a staff again. His hand, if he put it in his shirt uh, and bring it back out, it was covered with leprosy. If he put it back in, it would be healed. It would be fine, normal. And then if he poured out water onto the ground, it became blood. Those are some pretty miraculous signs to say, to prove that he was from God. Now, if Moses had these signs, it's reasonable to expect the Messiah, the second Moses, to have similar signs. Uh, but the group of people who had just come into the synagogue experienced a supernatural feeding. Uh, 
Uh, and the people who had not experienced that, well, they would want that as well. And that desire is reflected in their implied suggestion that, you know, what sign do you do? Well, our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it was written, he gave them bread uh, out of heaven to eat. Uh, the scriptures say that the, the manna was white in color and, and this shaped like coriander seed. So it may have looked like that. The word manna itself means, what is it? It's supposed to be tasting like a sweet bread made out of uh, uh, honey as well. And they use it, they crushed it to make flour or cakes or different things like that. Uh, so basically these people are saying, you know, what, what work do you perform? What sign are you going to give? Now our fathers ate, ate, from, ate the manna, so how about some lunch? You know, and then they quote Psalm 78, 24, which says that our fathers ate in the wilderness, uh, as is written, here's Psalm uh, 78, 24, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Now, the first Moses fed the people manna. And thus, if you're the second Moses, well, how about it? Now remember, it's Jewish, Jewish expectation, both in later rabbinic writings and uh, contemporary writings of second Baruch, expected the Messiah, when he came back, that he would again produce manna from heaven, bread from heaven. So if Jesus does this, then we will believe in you. If you meet our criteria, our expectations, what we want you to do. But what exactly would they believe? What kind of Messiah would they put their trust in? Obviously, the other crowd wanted a physical Messiah, a, a king to, A, produce food for them forever, uh, and great, they can heal as well, and overthrow Rome, and he would be the, that, that king to bring about that physical kingdom. Uh, that is probably exactly what they would expect and they would believe in as well. Well, Jesus answers them in the next verse and says, Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you true bread out of heaven. Now, Jesus is actually saying a lot here through implication as he corrects them. Notice he uses a past and present tense. The first line uses the past tense. It is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven. Implication, but it was my father who was giving you bread out of heaven. So the idea here is really, Moses really didn't have anything to do with that manna coming down from heaven. He just announced it to you. It was all a work of God. And his audience would not disagree with that. Verses like Exodus 16.4 communicate that it's God that's producing this thing. And so they would say, yeah, technically you're right. Yes, yes, God is the one who did it. And Jesus points out that Moses, just like the second Moses, was a servant or slave of Yahweh. Both of them must do the will of the Father. So the second line with the implication put in place is, I do not give you bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives, present tense, you the true bread out of heaven. So he's saying the same thing, just like Moses didn't really do this from his own will, it was the Father, he was just serving the Father. Jesus is the same way. But that present tense line, it is the Father who presently gives you the true bread out of heaven. How is it true? How is it real bread, genuine, sincere bread, opposed to the manna given to, to Moses, or given by Moses? By Jesus stating this, this is the true bread, He's making a contrast uh, between the manna, uh, the bread from the past, and the bread that's in the present. Now because it's coming out of heaven, both the manna in the past and this new bread, it shows and demonstrates God's gracious provision and His gracious care for the life of His people. And then He explicitly tells us the difference. In the next verse he says, For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Here's the distinction. Here's the, the how the present bread is, is greater. 
the bread that God gives, he gives to the world. So there's a difference in scope, and there's a difference in result. The manna was given in the Old Testament during the Exodus, wilderness wanderings, specifically for the life of Israel, for the life of the nation of Israel. But the scope now has been broadened. It's now not just for the Jewish people, but for the whole world. That would include both Jews and Gentiles. The giving life to the world echoes a climactic statement by the Samaritans who believed in Jesus when they said, it is no longer because of what you, talking about to the woman, said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Now this repetition by John, it shows a theme. It emphasizes that Jesus is the deliverer, God's deliverer, the Jewish Messiah, for everyone. And that's important for his readers, because his readers are probably not all Jewish, and they're definitely not living in Israel. That's the difference in scope. Now there's also a difference in result. This bread, the present bread, gives life. And that refers to spiritual life. This bread sustains spiritual life, salvation life. That salvation life that's with God, opposed to the manna that only sustained physical life. So with the declaration that God is presently giving bread from heaven, the people, then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. When they say Lord, they don't mean Yahweh or God. That word in Greek also just means a polite way of saying sir. So they're definitely seeing him as an authority figure, and they're asking nicely, sir, may you give this to, uh, to us? I always think, uh, you know, when someone's potentially in trouble, uh, the police officer comes over and pulls you over, uh, do you, then all of a sudden people say, sir and ma'am, right? Uh, I think it's kind of the same idea here, saying, sir, kind sir, please give us this bread always. So that their request signifies that they're still thinking in literal terms of an endless supply of physical bread. And notice, they say, always give. Always produce this. Give it to us continually. But they don't understand Jesus' point. That God has presently provided a greater bread from heaven. Their words also echo the confusion that the, the Samaritan woman had in chapter 4, where she said, Sir, give me this water, so I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw water. She was thinking literally, and thought his provision would relinquish her from work, would make her, her life a little easier. And the crowd is thinking the same thing. Remember, the time here is just before the Passover. And the Passover begins the harvest, where so this harvest will start all, some, all spring, all summer, and into the fall. Right now, they've been resting. They've been waiting for the harvest. So... At this time, work is about to begin. If he provides bread for always, well, their life would be a little bit easier. Therefore, Jesus then said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Jesus says it plainly, so they would understand. Jesus is the bread of life, the bread that produces life, the bread that they're actually seeking which comes down from heaven, the bread that results in eternal life with God. Now, this is the first of seven I am statements that Jesus will make in the gospel, where Jesus will say, I am something. And in every one of those seven instances, Jesus characterizes himself as a personification of God's graciousness towards man's need. So here when he says, I'm the bread of life, it's using uh, metaphorical terms to convey the absolute necessity of Christ by linking it to man's most basic and fundamental need of, of bread and of water. 
and that's connected with his person and with his work. So in saying this, Jesus has set himself up uh, as the antitype for the type, which was, was manna. So manna was the type. He's saying, look at that manna. That foreshadowed me. That was a type of me. And I'm fulfilling it in a greater way. So how is it greater? Well, number one, the correspondence between the bread that came out of heaven, between the manna and him, is number one, both were given by God's grace to provision for man's need. Both were nece necessary for life. The manna was for physical life. Jesus is for spiritual life. Life with God. And then number three, both must be received and consumed. There's a requirement of man to respond, to accept. You notice in the Old Testament, the manna just didn't go into a pot. The people had to go out, collect it, work for it, and then use it. But it was still provided for them. Here it's the same. You have to come and receive, consume, take in Jesus. Not that you're working for salvation, uh, but it takes a response. Notice Jesus speaks of the necessity of the human response here. He speaks of coming, meaning to desire to receive, not looking elsewhere, but going here. And thus believing, accepting is true, and incorporating into one's life, one's thinking, one's attitudes, one beha one's behavior and choices. And, and here he is speaking of a response in parallel lines. Looking at it this way, it says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me for that life, a life with God, well, he will not hunger. And he who believes in me for life will never thirst. This is classic Hebrew parallelism, where one is going right along with the other. We can def define one based on the other. So coming and believing reflect a continual habit of life, indicating that he is an endless supply of spiritual bread, of spiritual sustenance. And he's a source of endless water. Very similar to what he said to the Samaritan woman. The point of what he's saying, the theological importance is their hunger and thirst for God is met in Jesus. That's extremely important of what he's trying to communicate. And remember, hunger and thirst are metaphors for, for human needs of knowing God. And knowing God is, is a present experience of eternal life. And these are biblical themes. If you look at Isaiah 55, 1, and following it says, uh, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And, del and delight yourself in abundance. There's the endless supply, the abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Here's that response, coming to God. Listen, that you may live. It's in a message, the words of God. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. There's that eternal life. Uh, according to the faithful mercies shown to David. And then just a few verses down, he's in the same thought structure. But then he says it plainly. Seek the Lord. That's what the food is. That's what the drink is. The milk, the uh, bread. Seek the Lord while you may, while He may be found. <coughs> Call upon Him while He is near. Uh, and the same kind of concepts are found in Psalm 42, Psalm 63, Matthew 5, 6. Uh, but going back to what Jesus is saying, notice the end of the parallel lines. He says, will not hunger and will never thirst. Now in Greek there, they both have double negatives. So really a better understanding here is, the one who comes to me for life will never hunger, will never go hungry. And the one who believes in me for life will never thirst. And there's actually an untranslated adverb there in the Greek text at the end. And the adverb is always. Uh, just on the second line, he who believes in me for life will never thirst always. Now, it doesn't just go with the second line in Greek. When you put an adverb at the end, it's making it emphatic. It's an emphatic position. So it will go with the whole thing. But that always is used purposely 
because it parallels what they said. They said, Lord, always give us this bread. So Jesus is saying, come to me and believe in me, and you'll have it. Always. So the idea here is not just one bite, one sip, one nibble, and you're set. But Jesus is offering himself for the life of those who come and believe in him forever. To continually consume. Continually uh, a constant. He becomes a constant source of eternal life. So Jesus is not giving them what they think they want. But he's offering what they really need. And what their heart really desires. And I say offer because Jesus then says, but I say to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. The words see and believe are specifically connected to what they asked for in the very beginning. In verse 30, when they said, what sign do you do so that we may see and believe? In 36, Jesus is saying, you have seen me, and you don't believe. So this connection tells us two things. Number one, since they don't believe, uh, they're still hunger, hungering and thirsting to know God. They don't know God. They don't have a relationship with Him. They're not saved. And then number two, when they ask for a sign, like the bread coming down from heaven, because Jesus said, you see me, what that means is that He's the sign. He is that bread. He makes it clear to them that He is that sign from heaven. So therefore... Jesus does not give them the sign that they want, but he gives them a greater sign, even greater sign. Because he is greater than Moses, and he is greater than the manna. Now, realize, Jesus is not opposed to signs, to giving people signs of who he is, uh, of his divinity and his person and his authority. Because right now, he is already giving them the sign of his words, in his person. Number two, he gives them signs of healing. These people have, have seen it. Number three, he will give them the sign, the ultimate sign of his resurrection in the not so distant future. And then number four, he gives them the sign of the eventual record of his life and work recorded in the Gospels. Those all record the same signs. And all of these signs are given so that they may and we may see and believe and thus have eternal life with God. This statement of unbelief, it also connects with the Exodus theme. Hebrews tells us about that. Hebrews 4.2 uh, 2 says, For indeed, we have a good news preached to us, just as they, talking about Israel in the wilderness, also. But the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard it. So just like in Exodus, where they heard the word of God and didn't respond in faith, these Jewish people as well are receiving the bread, receiving the signs, hearing the words, and are not believing. So just as Israel in the days of Moses didn't believe God's word, and therefore didn't enter his rest into the promised land, so also the crowds here do not believe in the words of Jesus, and also will not enter into his rest. Now, isn't that startling? Isn't that kind of odd? Does this mean that Jesus is failing? Does it need, mean that he needs to re-examine his evangelistic strategies? Does he need to redefine his image to be more relevant to the fickle wants of the culture? Does this mean that God has not blessed his ministry? Or does it, their unbelief mean that God's plan is not being fulfilled? That brings us to the second topic of the discourse which is eternal security and the Father's will. So building off of what Jesus had just said, that all who come and believe will receive life, and you all have not, Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. So despite the crowd's response to Jesus, he's not discouraged, he's not surprised, he's not disappointed. He knows that his job is to be faithful to the task and the mission to which God has called him. And he leaves the results up to the Father. And 
That is an exact model for us as well. The results of any kind of ministry or anything we do, uh, sharing the gospel, sharing kind works, words with those who don't believe, even with believers, the results are in God's hands. We are called to go, to speak, to share, to love. The results and the impact on other people, that is God's in God's control. So success in God's kingdom is not determined by numbers. It's determined by faithfulness of those workers, those people in the kingdom. So here, the subject is eternal life. It's salvation. Uh, and in this verse, we find two distinct roles. The roles of the Father and the roles of the Son. So separate them out. All that the Father gives me will come to me. This shows a selectivity, a selecting by the Father. It, it implies that God has chosen some for salvation, reflecting His will. And He will bring it about, which will be <coughs> evidence in the fact that they will come to the Son. Now in that first line, the word all is neuter and it's singular, which is odd. We expect it to be masculine and plural, meaning all, all y'all. But here it says all in a neuter which emphasizes a group, one group in totality. It's a collective body of people, of redeemed people, which in eschatology, or looking at the end times, it refers to the bride of Christ. Redeemed people who will be united with Christ forevermore. This would include the Gentile nations uh, who would come, which has been the theme earlier. So the, this group, the Father gives Jesus, which shows three things. Number one, it shows that he has chosen out a group of people for salvation. Now that's known theologically as election. We saw that in 1 Peter 1. Also, Ephesians 1.4 tells us that that choosing, that election, the Father has done, the, specifically the Father has done, before the foundation of the world. Number two, it shows us that God has a sovereign plan in salvation. All, that group that the Father gives, will come. It shows a past, a present, and a future. And then number three, because the Father is giving it to the Son, it's a loving gift. God's redeemed people, His plan of salvation, His election, is a beautiful, loving gift to the Son. And we're a part of it. Now the second uh, line says, "In the the one who comes to me, will, I will certainly not cast out." And when Jesus says, or the text says, "Will certainly not," that's a double negative in Greek, which you can translate it, "I will never cast out." Now, cast out of what? He'll never cast out of the family of God, the kingdom, out of salvation, life, the relationship with God. He'll never do it. So what does that communicate to us? That salvation is he's secure. It's eternal. It's forever. Because Jesus will never cast them out. All those who come. Notice the repetition. Earlier, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. And then the second line, the same word. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast down. So their needs will be met, their spiritual sustenance in life, and that will be forevermore. The middle word for come is a different Greek word. Uh, it, it means, in general, it means the same thing, but that group of redeemed people will come into existence. It will happen. So all Jesus is just saying, uh, all that the Father gives to me, it's going to come to me. It's going gonna, it's gonna to become a reality. But then he, he changes and looks at the one. That's an individual. Not a group, but an individual. But the one who comes, who responds to Jesus as their Savior and their God, they will never be departed from Him. That is eternal security. So the answer, can you lose salvation? No. These two things here are, are, are large theological concepts. So can Jesus substantiate that? How do we know it's true? Jesus goes on in the next verse to say, for an explanation, for I have 
come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So first Jesus says, I've come down from heaven. If he's come down from heaven, that implies that he is pure, he is holy, because he's come from God. He's come on a mission, and he is part of that loving provision from God. His loving, caring provision for people. And because Jesus is perfectly obedient to the Father's will, we know that his plan, the Father's plan, will come to pass. So our, secure, our security is directly connected to the obedience of Jesus to the Father and the Father's will. Now, what is his will? The next verse says in 39, This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I will lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. So notice it says, The will of him who sent me. So this is God specifically speaking to Jesus. This is his will for the Son, his mission in coming to earth, in the incarnation. And that is all that he has given me. I lose nothing. That, that giving me is, is showing salvation from a divine perspective. Uh, and that perspective shows God's election, his choosing of people to be saved. And again, that all there is that neuter singular, looks at the whole of God's redeemed people throughout time. Uh, and Jesus says, all those, that, that whole group that he gives me, I lose nothing. Now literally in Greek, the I lose nothing says, I will not lose it from him. It will not be destroyed or ruined from God, from him. In other words, he's saying, they will not be separated from God. But, I will raise it up in the last day. I will raise it, the whole group, the whole body of redeemed people on the last day, referring to the resurrection unto a glorious existence uh, that will those people will follow in the resurrection of Christ and will have be glorified and live forevermore in the presence of God with, with a physical body that's glorified so now as a side note here, a theological side note because Christ is saying here there's one body right, one group that he will raise up in the last days that's a strong evidence for an, an interpretation of the end times, specifically a post-tribulational rapture. Now let me explain why that is. In a pre-tribulational rapture model, right before the tribulation occurs, the saints who have died are resurrected, and those who are still alive are transformed and changed and caught up into the air with Christ. And that is the resurrection. Right? 1 Thessalonians 4. And then, during those seven years of tribulation, there are many others that become saved. But they die. In a pre-tribulational model, their theology says, at the end of those seven years, those who died in Christ during those seven years are also resurrected. So you have two resurrections. But Jesus says, the one group of redeemed people, I will resurrect on the last day clearly points to a post-tribulation model. Post-tribulation model means the saints, the church, will go through those seven years of tribulation. Therefore, at the end, when Christ returns, all of redeemed people will be resurrected, and those who were saved who are still alive will be transformed at the end. Okay, so going back to this text here, how is that outcome secured? How do we know that Christ won't lose anything but we'll raise it up in the last day. Jesus has to die for our sin and rebellion, which separates us from God. And he has to raise up again victorious over death in order to grant us forgiveness and salvation. If redemption is not accomplished, then he will lose them from the Father forever. The responsibility of that is on the Son. That's his mission. Now, Jesus is going to actually speak of that. The text doesn't say it here, right? There's a question mark. There's a hole. There's a parenthesis. That he will speak about a little bit later on in the discourse. But in order for Jesus to secure that, doing the mission of the Father, he has to go to the cross and then pay for sin and be resurrected. 
So if any who were given were lost, if any, any of the people were given, that were given to Christ were ever lost, then Jesus would have failed to carry out the will of the Father. And thus the will of the Father would have been thwarted. Both of those concepts are unthinkable and they're impossible. Because God's will will, will happen. Because he's God. And Jesus, being God, will carry out the will of the Father. Because he's God. If their wills are not going to be met, then they're not sovereign, they're not God. So Jesus then speaks of the responsibility of those for whom the Father has chosen. In the next verse, this is the will of the Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. So here he says, everyone who beholds the Son, meaning who sees him, understands who he is, and thus believes in him. So some people will see the Son and understand what he's claiming, but reject him and not believe. But those who believe, they have eternal life now with God. Look at the parallel in verse 36. But I say to you that you have seen me and yet do, don't believe. So thus, again, Jesus is emphasizing here that they're not currently saved. And if they don't ever come to the Father, well, that means that the Father never chose them. And they will not be resurrected in the last days unto eternal life. They will be resurrected in the last day, but it's going to go into eternal death. So going back, uh, Jesus makes the point here emphatically that I myself will raise him up on the last day. Uh, he uses uh, the pronoun that's it's emphasizing his agency, his power, his eternality, and his authority within God's redemptive history. He's the one who's going to raise up his people to eternal life. So on the, when he says on the last day, this refers to a two-phase salvation. Number one, we have eternal life now. The moment we were born again and began to believe, we have eternal life with God. We are united with him. We become his children. And we are never to be separated. Who can separate us from the love of God? But that's spiritually. On the last day, we will have the redemption of our bodies. Our bodies will be renewed, restored, and glorified in the physical return of Jesus in glory. Because he was going to come back in a glorious manner, we have to be transformed into glory to be like him. Okay, now I'm going to conclude with a theological point and a theological note. If you notice in this passage, there we see a strong statement of human responsibility and response that balances a strong statement of sovereignty, of God's election. Man must come. They must believe. But God has chosen, and he's given. And, and that's secure. Both are true. But it is humanly impossible, given our earthly limitations, to understand how that all works out. How they fully work together and are both true. That God is absolutely sovereign in salvation is a foundational point to Christian faith. And those errant theological systems like Pelagianism, uh, semi-Pelagianism, and Arminian theologies that make salvation dependent on man's will, in effect, dethrone God. God's not really in control of it. Man is. That makes man God. Now, it's counter to clear statements in Scripture like this passage. Now, though they seem impossible to harmonize, there is no conflict between the two truths in the infinite mind of God. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things, they belong to the Lord, our God. But the things that are revealed, they belong to us. So what's revealed is that God's completely sovereign over salvation. He chooses. He creates people. He causes them to be born again. But also what's true is, from a human perspective, how do we know uh, that we say, well, we need to respond. We need to respond in faith and come to Him, repenting and believing. 
and trusting in Him. Both are true. Those are the two topics. And, and, and seeing that eternal security in the Father's will, we can see why eternal life that comes through the Son, bread of life, should be sought with far more zeal than physical bread that the crowd selfishly sought after. If Jesus is, is God incarnate, coming from heaven, and is therefore perfectly fulfilling the Father's will, then those whom the Father has chosen for salvation in the Son's work of redemption will be eternally delivered by the Son. That's comforting. That's our hope. That's the argument Jesus is making. That's the Bread of Life Discourse, part two. So let's go over the applications. Number one, Jesus is the bread of life, which, when consumed, results in eternal life with God. He is the demonstration of God's grace and care from heaven, being an endless supply of spiritual sustenance, whereby men can come and continually eat and drink and be satisfied. Man's spiritual hunger and thirst to know God is met in Jesus. Number two, the people were asking for a sign, and Jesus presents himself as a sign to see and to believe. He presented his words, person, his healing miracles, his future resurrection, and the eventual record of his life and works recorded in the Gospels. These signs were given so that the world would see, believe, and have eternal life through him. Number three, Jesus is not surprised, discouraged, or disappointed in the crowd's disbelief, but trusts in the will of God. His job was to be faithful to carrying out the mission God has placed before him, leaving the results to the Father. The same is true for us. We are called to share our faith and, and live and life and words, uh, but the results are completely in the Father's hands. Success in God's kingdom is not determined by numbers, but by faithfulness. Number four, God the Father is sovereign over who will be saved and comes to Jesus. This is known as divine election. And then number five, in the obedience of the Son to the Father, salvation is secure and eternal. God will pay for sins for sin on the cross, grant eternal life with God now, and raise the elect to everlasting life with God on the last day. Jesus states that he will never cast them out, informing us that those who are saved have eternal security. Okay, is there anything else you want to add or anything you want to ask on the application I missed? We want to turn that off. There's some heavy theology here. Anything that 